16 and 18 versions. We're not migrating to those yet. They have more complex workflows. So we're sticking to 16 right now. The idea is that there's a, if you keep to a very basic workflow, you can have a lot of power, but you have to know which features to use, which not. It's a, it's a big hairball as far as FreeCAD, uh, the complexity of it, which you can do with it. But if you stick to a basic, basic procedure, you can do a lot and, and really powerful stuff, like all the stuff we need for 3D printing or other, other design work, downloading our CAD files, modifying them. You can do all of that in 16, and that's what we'll cover, just a basic, a very basic thing that literally like freak out in one hour, how to get to basic functionality in like an hour's time, because it'll be important in our extreme design or extreme build events where you gotta get people doing something uh, as a team, and you can learn these things relatively fast. So say that you, you all appear on a Saturday, for example, uh, doing a design jam where there's design work, there's prototyping, there's 3D printers, there's laser cutters, CNC circuit mills, and so forth. If you've got all of that, um, you have to be able to onboard people very quickly. So to avoid like anything like, you know, like whatever, just, just version differences, for example, just things that are going to appear differently in others. And we even had it where one person installing, actually installing FreeCAD 16 on their computer their file actually looked different than mine. We are actually in the extruder itself. Remember our little initial eight millimeter tiny bolt for the back plate? That little hex hole there did not appear on his computer. And I was like, hey, what happened here? This is, this is wrong. It was appearing well on my computer, but for him, it's just the same identical file wasn't working. And that was because he had it installed and I was running off US, USB Linux. So there could be even little things like that. So it's, you know, there's still bugs in it. It's a program in development. It's an amazing package. There's a good community behind it. And all the advanced functionality like computer-aided analysis and all these different things, they're already in there. We do things like exploded part animations, fabrication drawings, all kinds of things with it already. And there's much more. But it is important like for the collaborative literacy part that we do all have access to the identical tool set. That's part of the, the way that mo more people can collaborate in a seamless way. So with that said, uh, there's, there's a bunch of disks here. Um, if you have one installed, do it at your risk, but we have a total of two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. You're welcome to take one. The ones that have, they're labeled like uh, OSCL3 and so forth. There's ones that don't have any, anything on them, so those are empty. Um, maybe I'll just take those out so no one gets confused. Just take them out. Okay, but all these take one if you'd like to follow the lesson. But we'll first start with uh, with a with an introduction on, on the extreme manufacturing and uh, <laughs> design jams concept as far as its power, what we can do with it and how it works. So maybe a little bit of history, like why we ever did come up with extreme manufacturing, the concept itself of how you can work with a group of people like yourselves, like what we're seeing right now, work to, to make a complex project happen. Like here, you know, we're, we're out here on the farm. When we first arrived, it was myself and my partner. You know, work is hard. You gotta get, you know, fight the weeds. You gotta, you know, do some agriculture, build your housing. So we did all of that, and, and labor was a huge, huge deal. I mean, and also being in the middle of nowhere, it's, you know, it's hard to get people to show up, but then people did start showing up. We, you know, we had little work parties here and there, and then we thought, well, okay, let's push that to the limit. What happens if, if you can do a lot of the prep work, all the design work, um, and then have people, have people descend for, for rapid builds? And that's the style we're using today. So, in a large way that, that addressed the labor issue, if you've got a good project going on, like, you know, say our fellows who are going to go off into their respective parts of the world, um, that's a thing we all want to develop, develop the communities around us, but also make it easier so that when a large group of people come together, it's not just chaos and people, you know, sitting around kicking the can. It, ex exciting good work happens. It's like, think of a like a rock concert but with a mission you know it's like I could see this happen where 
when we have the skills and tools, and you see we're kind of struggling, and you know we're we're developing stuff like you saw last night was a lot, you know, a lot of learning and stuff like that. But as we develop this, what's the limit of this? What's the practical limit? Can you get a stadium of people, or you know, that kind of scale of an event, like you know, a Grand Prix race style thing? The real extreme manufacturing thing, where you know, say you go to a disaster area and you just rebuild a city in a few days because you've got all the people that know how to do things, they know how to work together, they know the basic principles. So that's that's the idea. So for us, it started by a need that we need labor. And I think, I think that works really well because we, in fact, are turning that into the revenue model of how it can be economically feasible. If you have the, the designs, I mean, I always say design is a critical, critical link. There's design, there's the skills, and there's people. For the design, I mean, design is missing. There's not a lot of open source design out there, right? So that's what we're working on. The skills. We try to design in such a way that the skill requirement is minimized so that more people can get involved because we believe that you can do much more with a larger number of people than with a smaller number of specialists. I mean, that's how the world works today. Some people are very specialized, you know, they excel, and then say a lot of people are left behind. So we're saying let's lower the skill level but don't make it dumb also make it good design because good design elegant design will be simple a lot of the stuff that you see today is not simple because there's a lot of disconnect between from, from the very conceptual design to the actual usage so for example like the designer is not the engineer you know the engineer is not the builder. The builder is not the user. So then, therefore you ask, how can you have the design guy really understand what the last guy in the chain does if they are not the same person? You can't. It's literally like impossible. So you, of course you can get feedback and all that, but there's a difference in the, the bootstrapping approach, the fact that you're living with it, like we're living with a lot of stuff here, you know, like having the ponds get drained by accident in our aquaponics and stuff like that. You see all the stuff because you use it and, and you live more closely with it. And that's, that makes a huge difference uh, in terms of how appropriate a technology is to the limit that any person should be able to, to maintain their technology uh, because it's open source, the lifetime design issue is there where you can repair it and so forth. So, the, so that's very important. Uh, so that's the history uh, throughout the project here and also about five years ago so we, we teamed up with a with some collaborators in Washington State so it's actually Seattle um, Seattle area and that's called Team Wikispeed so they're these guys that have developed a hundred mile per gallon like open source ish car they're actually really not open source because right now they're working independent they're not really publishing anything uh, but they they entered a contest. The um, what's it's uh was it the the what is it the the X Prize the automotive automotive mm -hmm. X Prize they actually placed in it, uh, and they were priding themselves on an idea of their extreme manufacturing or extreme design process where they were using principles of Scrum and what they coined as extreme manufacturing based on agile processes to get that car developed in 30 days with like a whole swarm of people like us here. They, they have a workshop there. Uh, so myself and Joe Justice, the guy, so you go to, uh, I just want to show you this, because it is, it is quite remarkable. Uh, so that's Joe Justice, collaborator. Um, you know, he, he had a TEDx talk on, a, on his project where they got an, a remarkable result placing within the Automotive X Prize using like very, very simple, super modular design. So we teamed up a bit and we coined, it's actually if you look up Wikipedia, Google uh, Extreme Manufacturing, you're gonna see myself and Joe Justice as the originators of the term. We actually came up with that word about, uh, what was it, like 2012 or something like that. Uh, so you can read more about it. But there's certain principles in it of how you go about that process in order to make extreme, like real amazing efficiency happen. So I want to go over a few of those processes and then how we can apply those to our design gems, which we're going to be really kicking off 
in the future. We did a uh, what was called the Open Source Documentation Jam in New York City in 2012, where about 50 people from all over the, world, the U.S. primarily, it was in New York City, um, at New York University, we pretty much got together to define what the documentation standards for open hardware projects are. It was a great event, um, you know, lots of cross-fertilization of ideas, um, great, I mean, those are great events because you're combining the, all the different skill sets, uh, the social aspect, where people are teaching each other and, and basically hacking in real time using open docs. And, and, with, and at that point, there was no, I mean, there's no prototyping, you just talk to, to define some standards. But if you can now add the microfactory aspects to it, uh, you can be well off. Like, like for example, here's our CNC circuit mill. It's what you're it's similar to what you're building. Identical axis frame, different tool head. We've got a milling head, but the idea be, there being okay, it's modular, modular designs. You can make circuit mills, laser cutters, whatever. Your 3D printers, other machines. Uh, so if you have a construction set of parts that you can use in, a, in an easy way, many people can get access to that in an event like a design jam. So that's, uh, that's where the construction set approach comes in. Let's go through a few of the principles of the, the extreme manufacturing just to, uh, just to get a better idea for it. So we have defined these 11 principles. And the number one thing is, so it's all about breakdown. Like Linux has broken down a project into so thousands, like currently there's about a thousand or so people working on Linux. Does anyone know, know more figures on that? Lyle, Lyle's not here. You might, might know that. But there's about 1,000 people working on Linux, like 24 seven around the world, different countries. And it's because code, the code base is modular. You can have a little, you know, little pieces of code that do different things. Um, and as long as somebody knows how they fit together, you can have a large number of people work together. So is that possible for hardware? Well, absolutely. And we've shown that a bit. Um, so so you, you do a module-based design as, as the starting principle. <coughs> but in order to do module-based design, you have to understand how they fit together. And that's the principle number one. It's called contract first design. The contract, uh, I think, refers to the contract of how things talk to each other how do they and that's called the interface how do they interface like for example in a frame of the 3d printer all you need to know like say for nat making that um, in a workshop all we know is that the axes are going to be hung by these single bolt holes on the sides and that's like the interface for the rest of the motion system so as long as you know for Nat, if he knows, okay, that's the axis that's going to get placed in there, he can understand, well, first of all, he can do those, well, well we, we do the CNC cutting of the holes, so that goes into the design, but they're there, and we know that now he can build that independently, and we know your axis is going to fit, because we've defined the interface points. So when you do that, you get a number of people working, and that, that will apply to every single part of the, the 3D printer, for example. You can then work independently on the extruder, and you know it's going to fit. We can work on a heat bed, um, then the electrical panel, which is literally going to be hung on one side. We know how that's going to fit. So that's, that's the step number one. So step number two, test-driven development. You keep testing things. As soon as you build something, you want to test it to make sure it works. So that means, for example, before building, like say you're building something new, like our cordless drill, um, test-driven de design would be first that you're going to do some CAD on it. You don't just start building it, you know, maybe like building it out of, well, we 3D print the parts, but so obviously before that you're going to have to uh, get a CAD model of it. But before you do the whole thing, why not just print a tiny piece of it or a small scale version of it so you test it? Because every time you do some step of, say, physical production or um, development on, a, on, a, on an object, you can find many ways to test it. You can say, oh, let me see, how much does that weigh? Um, is that handle that I'm printing going to be like awkward enough for a person? Like, what's the dimensions of a hand? You can think about it, you can do calculations, um, you can do a lot of different things. So that's, that's called test-driven development. 
in our 3D printer, the way that applies is I wanted to have the frames done so that as soon as the very first axis is built, we actually mount it. And that's our test-driven development approach, which means that we don't wait till all the axes are done. We do the first one, test it, and then learn from it. So that is essentially test-driven development. Extreme learning. Um, we focus on training. So extreme <coughs> learning is that you provide an immersive learning environment because you don't want people just following directions. You want people to be given, provided with a uh, basically a design manual for uh, a thing that you're building. So a basic, basic set of design principles. How do you go about making a modification? Understanding it at that level. And right now for the 3D printer, we've barely started that. Um, that's one of the products we have to develop as a team in order to facilitate what we call viral replication. We're thinking, okay, we've got a construction set, it's modular. We teach people how to design it by providing a design guide. The design guide could be a very big aspect because it turns people from just users to designers. And you can do that, but you have to teach people. And you can't teach people what you learn at the PhD level where you get super, super focused on some very narrow areas, you have to teach them in a way that's boundary, like it crosses boundaries. It's not using the jargon of the field, it's using general language, things people can understand, and that are teachable. Because I mean, for myself, my experience has been like, okay, why am I learning all this crazy physics? A lot of times it didn't have to do anything with reality. And a lot of times I find myself these days, like for example, thinking about computer-aided engineering, you know, about analyzing some things in FreeCAD. Well, there's actually, now that's a real application of what I was trying to learn a long time ago, which made no sense. But right now, because I've got uh, real motivation, very tangible results, it's a different story. So learning. Uh, Design guides are a big part of extreme learning. The biggest part of the, I would say, of the extreme learning is you just throw people in there, uh, but you also want to provide enough guidance. Like uh, my comment on yesterday's yesterday's build, um, the way the extruder should have gone is after I showed it, I should have just walked everybody at the same time through that. I mean, because we we spent many hours, and of course there were other teams doing so that everybody couldn't participate. But that would be the ideal thing. The immersion learning comes from following somebody, because I mean, of course you can read the guide, but it's way better when you have somebody showing, okay, now do this step. I would actually prefer that in the future builds, like as we go about to our different areas of America here, um, try that process more. Uh, I think it works really well. I always try to encourage it, and I know there's resistance from both sides, because one, I mean, on my part, it means I'm spending all that time I can't do anything else, like watch anything else that's happening. It's just that focus. And also on the participant side, um, I do see some people are like, oh yeah, well I just want to move on to some other things. Some people are going to be quicker and they're like, oh I don't want to do this. The, the slow poke is slowing me down or whatever. So it has to be, I kind of have to let go a little bit of that and understand that, okay, if we work as a team, then everybody gets to the finish line. Because if not, some people might go faster, others might simply get left behind. And we like to keep everybody on board. So, okay. So optimize for change. So definitely in our in our work, agility, adaptability of the, of the design is foremost to achieve the desired result. The flexibility comes from the construction set approach right there. Um, flexibility, modularity, uh, big principle. I don't know what else to say about that. Uh, Object-oriented modular architecture. So I talked about contract fit first design. I really covered that. That is uh, kind of like the the first. Um, first part, and when you're modular, you can be modular at very at different scales. You can be modular at the like, for example, a screw is a, you can say it's a it's a modular component because it's identical. There's many of them. Then you can say, oh, we've got the axis, and that's a modular component, so that's a module right there. But then you can say, oh, the printer itself is a module in our uh, say. You know, say I got that wall back there, I stack like nine of them to, on top of each other, and that's our print wall. 
you know, that's the larger module, which, which consists of multiple machines. Or it could be the, um, you know, the 3D printer with the filament maker, like over there, uh, a little subset that now forms your little <coughs> microfactory. So, so you can consider it in many different, different scales. And then if you talk about uh, the materials, say under the screw, I mean, that's metal. So modularity there is you've got, well, if you have the ability to actually melt metal, you can say you're getting modular at the level of materials, you can actually make your material. You can brew up, like say st stainless steel, you add more vanadium to the induction furnace melt and you've got stainless steel. So you can be talking about we're modular now at the very material level. And you can take that to extremes one way or the other. Okay. Um, iterate the design. Uh, we know that you have to go through many different prototypes because no matter how smart you are, every time you're going to build something, you're going to learn. And there's going to be plenty of learning, so you've got to be open to learning, so you always iterate. Keep going at it and let the ego go. Uh, as soon as you think you know you got it nailed, then you're in trouble because things change. Um, so, iterate. Um, and iteration is not just to get higher performance. The big thing on iteration to me is simplicity. Sim uh, the ultimate great design is simple it's going to be simple and the, you know complicated stuff that you see out there that you can't even figure out it's not good design um, okay agile hardware hardware design patterns so this is a wrapper uh, there's a concept of a wrapper from software uh, someone want to ex explain that concept software people what's a wrapper and how does it apply to hardware um, so at least with video so you're probably all familiar with like the file extension, like an MP4 or something. So that's a container that video that's encoded in different formats can be put inside of. So it's an interface, essentially, with the rest of the computer. Um, as far as hardware, I mean, if you're looking at something as a pattern language, it's just modularity. Yeah. So you, yeah. can, you can have something that, in this case, would be physical connections to other components that could have different content. I guess within it. Yeah, it's something like that. It's it's when you uh, and ex it's kind of comparable to the contract versus that, to the design of an interface. It's really an interface. So think about say our extruder head. The interface on it is the magnetic plate, and that magnetic plate means that you can attach it to this three D printer, but you can also put it on something else. So the the extruder itself without the interface plate. Um, I mean, you can't, you have to design something that's, that will connect it elsewhere. But when you think about designing that interface, make that interface universal so it can be applied not just to mounting that head to the 3D printer, but to other, other things. So, um, yeah, that's a wrapper concept. I can say that, um, like for the universal axis, because we can attach it in different ways, we can do it magnetically, we can do it with the bolts through the face. We can do the bolts through the end. So you can call that kind of like the wrapper. But if you made, yeah, it's the different things you put under the core, above the core functionality to make it relate to other things in a better way. That's definitely a concept used in software and it's applied here. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Con continuous integration. Uh, in, iterate between product test, design, and manufacturing. So integration, uh, you're not just designing for, okay, this thing now works. You have to keep other elements of the design, which, which means taking things to market or to usability, like, like manufacturing. Okay, so say it works for you now. What do we learn about design for manufacturing? Like the thing we learned from the extruder head is that, wow, we got to simplify it. So we succeeded greatly in building it. We've got a bunch of them already built. But we learned, okay, now that's, that to me, like, yeah, that's just not doable. Uh, for a workshop like this, we either have to do it, you know, prepare all those beforehand or do something else. So if we think about the manufacturing aspect, design for manufacturing, we're going to say, okay, even though it works, we're going to need to design it different because of the other elements, like manufacturing. Continuously deployed development. Um, so, continuously deployed development. How do you go to market fast? Well, the idea is buy, 
because we're already modular and flexible in our design, we can, uh, in principle, go to market fast if we talk about marketing things and making an enterprise out of something. Uh, scaling patterns. So the idea, so create teams for each module. Design your process so it's scalable. So, for example, in the way we do the 3D printer, we think about, well, we do, like, take the axis. If we follow the process of, like, say I'm guiding everybody, okay, do one step at a time, I can teach one person to do that definitely, but it will be no different than, like, if there's 12 people in front of me, they could still do it, okay? Well, what if there's a stadium of people? So, there's a, say there's a thousand people. Well, you'd obviously need to add some elements like a microphone, like maybe a huge TV screen, uh, but also the design itself. And, and of course, you probably want to have like a box, like one of, one of the learnings from yesterday, like a box, everything for one person. Uh, we kind of ran into that first yesterday, like before we, when we had like 12 builds max, it was somewhat manageable for people to get, get the parts from the central pot. Uh, I think we really got to go to one box with the complete set of parts and tools. Uh, so that will be designed for scalability. If you give that to each person in that stadium, they can all do it. So, so design the process so you can scale it. If that's what you, your goal is, I think it would be a cool thing. Um, you know, say like you know massive events like whether it's disaster relief, for example, or just building like a whole workshop uh, in a rapid build session. Uh, design it so you can add more people. Um, so obviously design it modularly, but think about those things. Don't just get down and design it. Think about the dimension of, okay, how many people can do it? Because you're ultimately saying, is this going to be competitive with mainstream production? I mean, really that is, you have to acknowledge that that is the bottom question. Because if it's not, uh, this will always be a fringe movement. And we're talking about transferring that from a fringe movement of us early adopters here to something that anybody can do. And anybody can access that when the cost is right and quality is there and speed is there. In other words, it's economically sustainable or economically relevant, not something that's a work of art, one time, can't repeat it. If you wanna change the world, you have to think in that way that the diffusion has to happen and you have to make it easy for people. So, so the scalability part applies in there in that we can create a social process on top of a production process and that can be better. It's an experience that people enjoy. Uh, that's the goal. Any questions so far? So keep going, last one. So partner patterns. Okay, partner patterns is really about collaboration. So I'm using kind of the words from the, like the official uh, extreme manufacturer from the team, team wiki speed. Well, they, they call it partner patterns. So that means easy sourcing from many partners. For us, the sourcing is really more about, uh, because our sourcing is common off-the-shelf parts typically, of course we make some, some relationships such as with E3D, like I had to buy that on Amazon and I couldn't get like 20 of them at the same time, I had to buy like five, five, five kind of painful. Uh, but yeah, so one is the sourcing patterns, but for us it's more about the developer sourcing, like how do we find more developers and recruit them? So a big part of our work is the fact that because we're a public, <clears throat> public interest project, people are willing to collaborate and contribute effort. And we have to think hard, how do we make that easy for people? So there's easy onboard ramps, and we can partner in many, many ways. Uh, typically, companies don't think about it. If you're kind of like plundering the world, you can't easily ask somebody else to help you. That, it's, that may not be so ethical with this case here. We claim to be doing ethical work. It's easy for us to ask people, and I'm shameless about it. I mean, I, I do believe in, in what we're doing here, and that more people should be doing that. So uh, finding easy ways to attract others, collaborators for R&D from various sources, whether it's universities, whether it's individuals who are on a farm trying to make their operation go, whoever that is, um, we want to make it easy for them. Okay, so that's uh, that's kind of the main main part, and that leads to 
design jams where, okay, based on these principles, we know we have a modular design process, we break apart things into modules, and then the modules are developed according to a set of steps. So when you, when you take a large team of people to do that, they have to be informed about those steps, we have to train people what those steps are, but also make those steps as easy as possible, like, like I believe using the OSC Linux is part of that for, for the complex CAD tool. Um, and then you talk about collaboration architecture, like what is, first of all you ask, what things can be done in parallel? What do you need nothing as a prerequisite in order to get started on it? Which things do you have, depend on a thing being built before another thing? So you have to analyze it. But when you look at all those different steps, you can see that you can make some sort of headway, at least a little bit, on just about every single step. Um, so, but that's where the rapid iteration, like we talked about one of the principles was iteration, that you have to keep going, just keep going over and over. Typically the mindset is, okay, I gotta do this big thing, I need more information, I can't start. You know, uh, but here is, you got low cost accessible tools like a wiki. Okay, so you just, even such a thing as start a page, start a document like a Google Doc, where you do like a conceptual design or something. Um, even those things are already progress, right? Assuming that, so say it's a one day extreme design jam, assuming you have a way for people to continue it. So you have to be organized in some way, have a, have a venue where, where cloud editable content really makes that possible. So a lot of times people don't really think along the, the route of, okay, well if I do just a little bit, well that's nothing. You know, like that doesn't help anybody. But that's not true because the next person, the next person, the next person that builds upon it, they do push it forward but that means you have to document it or communicate it in a way that people can build upon it. So, so don't start going off into like really technical stuff. Just try to teach, try to talk to the computer when you're documenting, like you like a person is going to follow you with it. Uh, and you have to assume that, and that's how Wikipedia kind of does it in some way. I mean, not really because like Wikipedia has hundreds of of moderators that are really picky about the content and they really make it go but uh, for us we don't have so many facilitators or uh, maintainers like in Linux uh, we don't have that a lot I mean we're trying to build that uh, but the idea is you have to switch into this different mindset that says okay first of all what I'm doing is important you know you have to start with that if you don't start with that, you're going to say like, oh, well, who's going to do this or whatever. So start by picking important problems. And that forces you to, to go back a step and say, hey, uh, what's a big, hairy, audacious goal that I can solve today in my or in my lifetime? It forces you to, to get a bigger, expand your viewpoint to something bigger. And I see a lot of people, um, they're like, well, you know, I'm not going to document it. Who, who cares about it? And then, then my, my response is to, well, okay, if nobody cares about it, why are you doing it? You know, don't make yourself useless to society or, you know, like, um, relate as much to the greater world as possible, of course, because then we can make it all better, all a better world. Don't go like in academia where you go super tight focus on one thing and you have no idea what else is up in the world uh, because that ends up causing problems. So. It's, a, it's largely about mindset. We call that collaborative literacy. It's a thing that in today's system we're just not used to. It. Like, even just the notion, like we get some developers that come to the program and they're like, uh, what? Like, I have to document, or just the fact that, you know, uh, I think it runs into esteem issues where, it's, where people are like, oh, I can't document it, it's not finished, you know, it's, I'm going to look bad and stuff like that, or my reputation is going to go down or whatever. And that's very, very common. I mean, even I was talking to Dr. Pierce, as I mentioned, from Michigan Tech University, academic open source. Um, and I told him, look, man, we, we are doing a bootstrap funding mechanism, so we don't care what anybody says because we pay ourselves. We generate the funding, so we're more independent. Uh, we don't care about reputation. We do, of course, because we, we do good things. Um, 
but Dr. Pierce told me it's like, well, I can't publish early stuff because then my reputation is going to go down, you know, even though I, I try to tell him, well, okay, well, you can do disclaimers, say, okay, this is experimental, uh, do it at your own risk, but still, the kind of culture that, say, the academia may be in, it's like, okay, that may not even work, you ha you're kind of used to finishing <coughs> something, and, well, publishing the finished thing as opposed to publishing the process. I mentioned yesterday that it's the process that's important because that's most of the time you're in process. You publish only, okay, you spend a week publishing something you spent a year on or something like that. So don't avoid the collaboration aspects on that whole process throughout because that's how more, more stuff can get done. Uh, but if we are specific about, say, a design jam, if you go through the collaboration architecture, what are all the things that can be done in parallel? Okay, let's, let's go through some. So, Study of industry standards. What is that? So if we design a 3D printer, we might start by benchmarking it, saying, okay, who else is doing 3D printers for builds? Okay, we found I made 3D. We found 3D for EDU, which is the Michigan Tech guys, actually. Uh, you do some benchmarking, you see what other people are doing. You don't need anybody to, any step before that, to start exploring that. So absolutely, someone can, you can, we can get somebody to do that step. So if somebody is fully informed what that step means, that person now, we're, you know, we're meeting up, we're getting our powwow, we, we have some uh, coffee or whatever in the morning, we start, yeah, that person can just go off and say, okay, internet, um, start searching, looking for things, communicating. That can be done in parallel with everything else. What, second step, concept diagrams. Well, probably somebody in a, in a group right now, myself or some other people, might have the basic concept of what a 3D printer is. So start diagramming it in a Google Doc. Put down as much as you know, because the next person in the room is probably gonna can possibly add to it. Like uh, Sarah, you, you know, you said, okay, I know a printer has a frame and it has an axis. Okay, so do a conceptual drawing of that, and I can add. Okay, there's one piece like the cable routing at the end over there, and uh, so people can start pitching into the stone soup, and and that's definitely uh, doable with concept diagrams, because conceptually, like anyone, probably everybody here has a concept at least somewhat of what a 3D printer is, if we talk about a 3D printer. And don't be afraid of putting that down and then it could be built upon, but I think the main barrier there is, okay, make sure you're, you're, you're open, you are flexible in your mind, understanding that, oh, uh, maybe I got it wrong, I, I can't do that, I might look bad. You can't do that. You gotta, um, you gotta have the self-esteem. So I actually do say that the dimension of self-esteem is very important to open source work. Uh, and you can be vulnerable, open to critique, if internally you are not uh, comfortable with yourself. And that's why part of the deal here is that, uh, I talk about integrated humans, uh, you do have to work on the different dimensions. You have to work on your technical skills, your, per your internal skills, like your, your personality and, and comfort with yourself. It gets into the psychology, like the psychology of open source is pretty interesting because uh, um, it forces you to be a, an open, kind of like a vulnerable or um, teachable person. So it's definitely, um, the personal dimension is there. Okay, CAD. Well, someone who's got knowledge of free CAD, so they would have to do our one hour crash course that we're going to do right now. They have to have some basic idea with it. Um, Instead of spending a few hours installing it, they can, in uh, like five, you know, 30 seconds, can boot up OSC Linux. Um, because it's also got all these add-ons, for example. We, we, the core FreeCAD, when you download it, it just has the basic modules, but the one we have, we put in a bunch of other modules that we need. So for you to do that, for, you, I mean, you have to download it from different places. It's hours, hours of work. You know, first of all, you have to find out what works, what doesn't. In our thing, the CAD could be doable real time within 30 seconds of us entering that room, pending a person knowing free CAD, and then having an idea, like if we're doing a 3D printer, well, if we have a model of a 3D printer, and say we don't have the final CAD, which we actually don't at this point, because that uh, the one the version 18.08 is not in CAD. So, okay, one person can do that, or multiple people can do that, in fact, you can get like 12 people or 24 people to do that. Take each person, CADs up, well, if the CAD didn't exist, we have the CAD of the modules, but 
Uh, you can get a number, a team of people doing that, just cutting up the parts and then putting that together. So absolutely you can do that in parallel. Now what happens if you didn't have the machine built yet? Well, there's other steps you can do on CAD. If you know that that machine uses the bolts from McMaster Car, McMaster Car has freely downloadable step files that you can import into FreeCAD. Or if you want to get a, the CAD of the extruder, actually Lulzbot 3D Printers has a copy of the extruder, not, not the one we're using, but some company might have that, and you can download it, put it on our wiki, <coughs> uh, make it, enter that into the part library that we use. We have a page on the wiki called D3D, which is the name Distributed on Price 3D Printer, D3D Part Library on the wiki, and we're just collecting all the parts. So even if we had no idea of what the CAD looks like, start building a library. So once again, doable absolutely in parallel. Next. Oh yeah, so I mentioned the part library creation and curation, so that's, that relates to CAD. Calculations. All right. So we know that we're going to build a larger 3D printer. How much are the shafts going to bend once we go to three feet? Is it going to be acceptable? Okay, what if we go to six feet? Is it going to be acceptable? You can do that through calculations. You can do basic beam deflection calculations. You can go, anyone in here could, with five minutes of explanation, take a beam deflection calculator that says, okay, uh, it's online, Google beam deflection calculator, and you say, okay, the rod is so thick, it weighs so much, and it'll actually tell you what the, how much it will hang by its own gravity. So that's a calculation a non-scientist could do. If you get, you know, maybe an hour of training on FreeCAD, you can do finite element analysis within FreeCAD, and you can simulate it in FreeCAD saying, okay, we've got this material that's, say, 50,000 PSI strong, you know, that's the strength of the material. Um, you input that, you draw it up in FreeCAD, and you say, okay, put a load down, down on it, which is like, you know, 100 grams, which is the weight of the rod. How much will that deflect? So you can do that absolutely in parallel. Um, 3D printing. Okay, laser, okay, calculate. Laser cutter scale model prototyping. Okay, we have a laser cutter. What can you do? We have the electrical pa mounting panel where all the things, all the electrical components are, are fit on a piece of plexiglass. That person can say, we know what components go on it. They, that person can cut up a file of what the laser is going to cut. So it's called CAM file, computer aided manufacturing. You can draw it up even in, like an Inkscape. Actually, Inkscape has an export that you can export DXF files or files that uh, you can cut with a laser cutter. Um, so that, that could be done in parallel. If we got a laser cutter on site, somebody can make that, that, that control pan, mounting panel. Like if we had that right now in a workshop, someone could be doing that right now. We don't. Um, and, and so, so laser cutter scale model prototyping. So not only real parts, but scale models. For example, the CB press is made entirely of half inch thick plate steel. It's CNC cut. Well, you can, with a laser cutter, you can easily cut one eighth inch cardboard or plywood, and you can cut all the identical parts and glue them together. So you have a tiny scale model of the complete machine. And that way you can test <coughs> your entire CAD file without having burned all that metal if you make a mistake. So, very important. 3D printing, well that's an obvious one. You know, for the cordless drill, we can print our parts or whatever. Like, right now, if we, someone was, we didn't have the extruder proper, we could have hit the printer, print ourselves an extruder if we ran out of parts. So you can be actually making the parts that you design on, on the site, or you can prepare parts, and you can be printing them during the event. So very important. But speed is an issue, because uh, if you go slow with a tiny nozzle, it takes, you know, it can take days. Um, just for reference, uh, <clears throat> a whole plate, like 20 of those, say, uh, um, I was printing the plates, the idler, the things we built first yesterday, no, the carriages with the bearings in them. About 10 of them take you, if you go at 100% speed, I mean, they take you like 8 hours or 12 hours. 10 um, full parts or 10 halves? <laughs> halves. It's a lot of time. Now, that's going, say, 100%, but we were running more like 400%, so that went down to much lower things like that, but that's going to be a definite time sink 
those are not 100% infill. Uh, we use typically 20% infill, which means it's got like a zigzag pattern on the inside. But if you're looking for very hard parts, like for example, a coupler for the hex shaft, like um, on the benchtop grinder that we have down there in the workshop, I printed the bearing holder. It holds the hex bearings. That you definitely want to have 100% printing. Um, so it's a full solid, solid piece of plastic, which is like the plastic is going to be about 8,000 psi strong. It's about one fifth to one tenth the strength of metal. But you definitely need the full strength if you're going to have a grinder that's got a lot of force on it when you're cranking that or running it with a motor. It's going to have a lot of force on it. So uh, at that point, like that that single part took like. Uh, the one coupler is, or that one bearing, I think it took about 12 hours to do just that one bearing. So if you had a machine with many of those, you either have an army of printers or you use like a bigger, bigger print head. So right now we're using 0.4 millimeter. You can go up to, off the shelf, you can get up to 1.4 millimeters right now very easily. But the speed goes as a square. So square, um, because of area, is pi r squared. So if you have a, for example, between a 0.4 mil millimeter, just going up to 0.8 uh, or 1.6, well, uh, that's 1.6 is what four squared. It's gonna be 16 times faster. So it really makes a difference what kind of nozzle you use. Uh, quick question. Yeah. What kind of perimeters do you use, like uh, outside perimeter? Uh, don't know yet because we haven't actually run the 1.4s yet, so okay. that's that's future work. The extruder that we have right now can accept a different heater block. The one we have is like a flat pancake. There's a bigger one that stands vertical and it, and the it's a little bigger. It's called a volcano nozzle, uh, volcano heater block, and it, that can do the 1.2 or 1.4 millimeter, and that's going to be really fast. You have to modify it very slightly. You have to uh, actually reprint the body because the current body does not hold. Uh, because of the way the fan is mounted, it does not hold the larger head, but you can, once you have this running, you can easily print an upgrade so you can use the larger nozzles. So 3D printing. Shredding waste plastic. Okay, so we got some misprints that, that we can shred right there. So to your design jam, bring your hand cranked shredder or bigger shredder. Like the one I have in the workshop is just a hand crack for, for, a, for an example, but that's, you know, it's a tiny little thing. We can bring that to the to the design gen, we, you know, we, we come with a trunk full of uh, equipment like a 3D printer, a little laser cutter, the shredder, filament maker, and we can, we can do all at a very, very small scale. Um, making 3D printing filament from lunchtime waste plastic, hey, that's great if we uh, got any waste plastic, like for example, the wrappings of the rods, the yellow stuff, we should be shredding that and making plastic out of that, so you actually have an eco-friendly design gen. Laser cutting of actual parts from plywood or cardboard. Yeah, so I, I mentioned already with the mounting plate for the electronics. Electronics CAD, tomorrow we're gonna get into starting into, into key CAD, but other people can be designing like, uh, for example, like the, the, the controller parts in there that we have, the power supply. All those parts, uh, you can largely print or cut with a CNC circuit mill like that one where you have a rapidly spinning little tool bit and you're milling your circuits and you're populating it with, with components. So you can be making all your controller parts, uh, even power supplies. The idea there being, once again, it's the concept of lifetime design as opposed to that breaking. If it breaks on you, you throw it out. If you mill it yourself, you understand everything. You can replace the parts. You design it for uh, disassembly. Design it for replaceability. Breadboard port prototyping, like say we were doing some electronics projects, little breadboards are little uh, things with holes in them that you connect the wires, that can happen. Um, CNC circuit milling, that can happen. Blender modeling and rendering, so you know, you get good renderings or stuff you want to communicate to the public. Uh, nice images, say of the CD go home or something in a nice environment. Yeah, you can be someone who's got blender skills or rendering skills can do that at the same time. I mentioned CAE sim simulations in FreeCAD. Coordination with re remote teams via OSC design jams. 
you can do like Facebook page to do ready uploads like in a workshop we don't have internet we should have that we got to put that in there finally um, but uh, in a design jam you can uh, one person could be dedicated to being the, the ambassador to other teams and you can be saying okay hey guys how are you doing where are you at do you have some materials that we can take from hey we just discovered this thing on extruder here's the new design so you can be uploading downloading exchanging information through the internet and that can be global and if it's when we develop this properly, I mean, imagine having that as a solid event every month where we get some serious work done. Um, that could be really good. Website is updated in real time, including a live feed. Um, people can be updating, whether it's social media, website, um, if we have, you know, if that's part of the game. Beauty scanning by photogrammetry for reverse engineering. Say we've got a hydraulic motor on a, on a tractor that last time, for example, it didn't really fit because we didn't have accurate CAD. Once we develop the photogrammetry, the 3D scanning techniques, that can be happening. Someone can be dedicated to spend all day getting a perfect model, uh, get the first the rough image, then clean it all up, put it into FreeCAD. There's a whole bunch of steps involved in that. That can be happening. Uh, uh, LAI, so language agnostic instructionals. Uh, thing that looks like what I showed on the brick press yesterday. We have a really nice workflow within FreeCAD to do that. You can extract very nice isometric drawings within FreeCAD, put that into Inkscape, clean it up, and get really professional grade um, these uh, language agnostic instructionals with very clear, crisp images from different angles, uh, part of the process. Exploded part animation creation within FreeCAD, actually very easy. You pretty much, uh, when you have a built model, you can click on one and it will draw you a, a line coming from that. So you can basically explode one part, next part, next part. And it shows you how a thing is made, very useful. And you can record that, as it's a quick learning tool. Software vetting and testing. So if we have programmers at the same time, Say we got to upgrade the code for um, one thing I can tell you we want to upgrade is when you first start, the first layer is critical. It would be nice to have real time adjustment. Like if it didn't get, if the bed leveling didn't work perfectly, you want to adjust very slightly, um, tune that a little bit right with the knob on our controller. That's not in the current version, and I'm not sure if it's in the stock version of Marlin, the software, but that's an example of something that a program could pretty rapidly, well, I mean, it's C programming. They can look into uh, Marlin and go in there. So someone who knows Marlin would definitely be able to do that. If it's a smaller change in Marlin, someone with moderate skills could do that. Um, or somebody could just upload the new code to the controller. That's anyone with Ar who knows Arduino environment. We use Arduino. We put a, attach a USB cable to the controller. We upload the software to the controller. Uh, anyone could do that, you know, so, so just another step that can be done by somebody else. Project <coughs> integrator, project integration is a big thing uh, because there's all these people, while people working together, the, the coordination is needed. Uh, it's useful to have periodic check-ins to see where everybody's at and everyone get updated where, where things stand. And so, so there should be a person dedicated to that uh, because th that person will really make things flow much better. Uh, so the integrator part, that person has to be very well aware of all the different aspects of the process uh, in order to be effective at it. Publishing. Uh, publishing can happen in real time too. Like they have a, uh, some other people do what's called book sprints. They get a bunch of people together and they use, uh, they document some project, like a, typically a software project. That's something we can be doing at, in real time as well if we get dedicated documenters. So. Uh, someone might be perfecting the build procedure, like some people were complaining about the build procedure, which of course is incomplete. Um, they could make updates, publish it in, in high quality uh, format. There's, uh, what's the open source desktop publishing software? It's called, uh, I forget what it is. Does anyone know what that is? The like word processing and stuff? No, it's it's a standalone thing. It's like the open source version of Photoshop that Are exists. Hmm? No, that's that's Inkscape. Talking about GIMP? No, no. There's another one that's the the open source desktop publishing. So those kinds of tools actually do exist. 
Uh, they're not yet cloud editable, so what we do a lot of times, we just use the Google Docs where many people can collaborate on that. That would be the preferred route because you have no boundaries to uploading files, downloading. Um, Google Docs is really nice. Um, pretty soon, an open source version of that will come about. But publishing is a major topic that can happen. You can have a whole team dedicated just to publishing, like all the stuff that's happening there, like all the stuff that's happening in a workshop. And same with video production. If you have video people there, they can be editing the footage and, and making that in real time. Uh, just like a few years ago, we had we were uploading images and some short clips to the internet and somebody edited a video remotely. So the video part can happen on site and remotely. Um, build materials generation. So we have a template where you list you know, your part, your cost, delivery time, minimum order quantity. There's a whole thing. We have a whole template for that. Uh, some person can be finalizing that or if it doesn't exist, starting it from scratch or building upon missing pieces from it. If it exists in part. Instructional production, uh, we kind of covered that. Dashboard page on a main site or somewhere, it's useful to have, uh, just to give you a, an example of what I mean by a dashboard, <laughs> but something that has a lot of the content, video feeds, results, <laughs> logging, like this is a very simple thing. And, but basically, you know, you've got like a video introduction here. You might have a breakdown diagram. You might have some uploaded videos, tasks done, map of collaborators, scrummy ta like scrum task board. So you can do this kind of a, like for the project we're working on, you can have some critical assets. Like say we're collaborating with multiple teams. You know, they're on a map. Maybe you're, put, you're logging the, the latest tasks, updating live feeds. Like you can maybe have like a live feed video feed in there, uh, maybe like even Facebook Live where you're actually reporting and you know, every on top of each hour you're reporting, okay, hey, this is where we're at, quick check in, we run, you know, we run to the computer, we check in quickly. So so a little dashboard interface would be really useful. We use something that looks kind of like that. We can do something uh, with the wiki you can do do enough already. We can use a very basic thing or we can get more funky as time goes on, but there's a lot of different things we can do. Um, what else? Then fundraising. Oh yeah, like fundraising. So HeroX is a preferred platform. So we just learned about it a year or two ago, uh, about two years ago. Uh, so this is a, an offshoot of the XPRIZE Foundation. It's a crowd design, crowd funded platform. So it's an incentive challenge platform. You put up challenges, and you also have the capacity to fundraise for them through that same platform. So you do that, you can raise the money for a prize, and it doesn't cost you anything but ideas. So you have to spend the time to communicate your ideas and motivate people, uh, put up all the assets that you have to motivate people to collaborate, put up some videos maybe, and then fundraise it. So then you get a bunch of people collaborating on that with an incentive uh, because a lot of people work on incentives. Uh, one, it could be plain financial. Second is people are like, oh yeah, this is a cool thing, and they get recognition. So people are in it for different things, but the incentives, if you can create a good structure for that, using a platform like HeroX, and there's others, um, that really helps the process. So at that point, you have expanded your design jam from all those people on site to, to like tons, potentially tons of other people, uh, if you do it right, collaborating independently just as little teams. You can make the rules such that they don't reward competition, that they reward collaboration. So for example, we can write the rules such as, okay, you get a point or whatever, however we grade it, for your early uploads. So discourage, you might even have a disincentive, like um, don't publish it, like on the last day, like we reward, we give points for continuous, uh, continuous publishing. So you can do things like time logs or just logs of tasks, but keep track of it. The hardest thing is to how do you keep track of all the contributions? There has to be an easy mechanism to do that. For us, it could be, okay, we've got maybe like any person who's collaborating, we can say, okay, here's a template on the wiki, upload your CAD right here, log your tasks here, 
bam, you know, just that basic element, and then keep you know, log of task. But you have to have that has to be scalable. Wiki does it; it's scalable. You can have a thousand people do that with their own page. Then you can have maybe one index page for all the co contributors or all the competitors.